they didn't like just come out and say they had a certain number of daily active users. They sort of were like, here's our monthly active user number and here's a bunch of other numbers. And then like four tweets down, we're going to refer to a Coindesk article to say that we have 8,000 daily active users. It doesn't matter. Like yeah. it doesn't matter. It's so much lower than it needs to be. <laughs> like and whether that, it's 50 yes. or 8,000, it, do, it really doesn't matter for reference for people. Roblox has like 200 million. The fact that we're even talking under the scale of like millions right now should be like red flags. Hello, everyone. GMGM. GM. Welcome back to another episode of Overpriced JPEGs. It is time for our weekly recap where I and Today with a guest, which I'm excited about, we'll be talking about all the things that have happened this past week in the world of NFTs, the metaverse, etc. And at the end of this episode, for the last 30 minutes or so, though realistically we may go longer, I'm going to be joined by Jeremy Goldman, who is really a, an, an attorney who has carved out a specialty in the space of Web3 in particular. He'll be joining us to talk about the news around the SEC investigating the board ape founder, founders, a uh, little bit of, uh, there's a lack of clarity, I would say, around really what's going on. So he's going to help break down what we know thus far, what we should be looking out for, what this all could mean for the space, which is, I think, the, the most important topic of the week. Joining me for all of this is the one and only Austin Hurwitz. Austin has been on the podcast before. He is the author of the newsletter, One Big Idea, having recently left Venice Music. Austin, thank you so much for joining the pod. GM, GM, thanks for having me again, Carly. We went viral last time, so we have we have something to live up to. That's true. <laughs> High stakes. Uh, Austin came on last time. We talked a lot about the music industry and NFTs and Web3 and all of that good stuff. And, and we talked a little bit about Spotify and it got like 130,000 hits on TikTok. So uh, bring it back, running it back, you know. Um, we're going to dive in real fast here because, again, want to want to get through some of the other news that hit this week before we're joined by Jeremy. But before we do that, I do need to carve out a space to hear a word from our lovely, lovely sponsors. When it comes to NFTs, convenience often wins over security, despite scams being everywhere. Brands and artists have no other choice by complying with big marketplace terms and weak security because no good alternative exists. Which is what prompted Ledger to fix the problems of NFTs themselves and launch Ledger Market. The Ledger Market provides an end-to-end -end secure NFT experience for brands, artists, and users, enabling true ownership and control over NFT assets from minting to storing. Ledger Market secures NFT projects via Ledger Enterprise, keeping you protected from phishing attacks and scams. And the market directs users to Ledger Live, where they can transact with a contract directly, giving clear signing details instead of blind signing and praying. Don't trust, verify with clear signing from Ledger Market. Stay up to date on the latest drops and the marketplace updates by following Ledger on Twitter and joining the Ledger Open Discord, which is linked in the show notes below. Bueno is the NFT toolkit you need to launch your digital collectible on the blockchain without coding. Every step of the NFT creation process, from generation to mint, all taken care of by the Bueno NFT toolkit. With Bueno, you can load up your art layers, reorder the layers, tinker with rarity, everything you need to make your NFT project a reality. Bueno even allows you to mint your tokens on the blockchain with zero code and offers advanced minting logic like linking allow lists, airdropping tokens, and on-chain royalty configuration. As a part of their Launchpad, you'll get access to forums to run surveys, email collection, and build your pre sale list to make sure you are hooked into your own community. Bueno is full of powerful tools you need to build the most expressive NFT project possible. So go to bueno.art and start building your own collections today. All right, let's start with D Gods, who uh, that, that's a project that I feel like just knows how to get attention, knows how to make news, which frankly is half the battle in this space is just cutting through the noise, even in a, in a bear market. So two big announcements coming out of the D-Gods project this week. We had their 0% royalties announcement saying they're dropping secondary royalties to, to zero. They won't be taking a cut of secondary royalties on D-Gods. And I believe Utes as well. Was it for both? Correct. Austin? I think so. And then um, they also, and this was an announcement that I feel like got a little lost because the 0% royalties thing got, got so much attention. Um, they will be every day documenting how the team spent their day. The goal here, my understanding, is to be like, hey, just because we're not tweeting or you're not seeing something or you're not seeing an announcement doesn't mean we're not working a building. We're going to open up essentially our offices metaphorically and give you an insight into how we're spending our time. What do you think of these two announcements? Maybe we'll take them one at a time. 
Yes, let's start with the 0% royalties. I think, and Carl, you've talked about this before, you know, it's a personal decision for every brand if that is going to be the right time or right decision for them. I do think where a lot of people's like ire came from was the fact that they announced 0% royalties uh, after they had raised funding. And granted, it was for Dust Labs and not for D Gods and Utes, but it felt a bit like virtue singling. And I know that we've got a, another topic coming up later around royalties and, and what it means to actually go 0%. There's a lot of negative outcomes that could result if we move to a 0% royalty space. Let's talk about that now because we've got so much yeah, to cover. Let's, we, let's not make it a separate topic. Uh, there was a thread by Kemosabi. Kemosabi? I don't know if Sounds I'm pronouncing right. you right. We'll, we'll link to it. Just say it confidently. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Kemosabi had a, had a thread. Perfect. And... Um, really kind of laying into the idea of 0% royalties. Do you want to speak on that a little bit um, in this context of, of this D-God's decision? Yeah, I'll, I'll try to do it justice. It's a really long thread. Definitely recommend everyone take a look at it. But some of the overarching themes were you know, this is going to result in a lot more rugs. And the argument, the thesis being that this actually started due to some policies from Magic Eden in which they were taking pretty aggressive royalties and having this what was called like a mint out and pump it philosophy because that was going to drive a lot more traffic. And so they were driving um, NFT projects to to mint out quickly and, and take royalties. Removing the royalties was kind of like a response to that. And, and actually like Magic Eden since has lost a significant amount of market share. Um, but it, it, the the author really goes into detail of like one – you won't have like anyone buying projects anymore because there's no recurring revenue. Two, and I think this is honestly the biggest point, this was the reason a lot of people got into the space to begin with. It was the idea that like art lives on and you should continue to be valued and credited for it. And so to remove that, it feels like it's taking a giant step backwards for a lot of people. Um, and yeah, it goes, goes deeper into, again, like this could lead to a lot more rugging, right? Because if you don't have an incentive as a founder to stay, like if you don't have a recurring revenue, it, it's, it's going to lead to people just pump and dump. And then also, as you think about, you know, people building out roadmaps, um, and then what the impact could be there, it, it seems by and large to be a lot more negative than positive. When well, strikingly, the market as a whole seems to reflect that because, the D gods, you, it's like the prices fell after this announcement, which I'd be curious what they were expecting the reaction to be. Um, I, I do think this is a, this should be an individual project decision. If you are a project that feels you have other revenue streams that can support your build out and that those other revenue streams can support a build out that will ultimately benefit your holders. Cause that's, I think really where a focus needs to be. Then I think it's okay. Um, in fact, I, I think there can be, you know, if you're not an art specific project, I'm a huge, huge believer in artists absolutely taking royalties. That feels like the entire freaking premise. I think that's a lot of people were drawn to this space on the idea that, oh, my gosh, royalties or artists can be paid royalties now throughout the, the lifetime, as you sort of mentioned, like of their work. Um, I've talked about it with like ticketing and events and like why a Katy Perry might and obviously want to have her tickets as NFTs is she could get royalties on those bought resales, you know, or like w w whatever else. So I think royalties are incredibly important to like the core value prop of NFTs. Um, but I am open to to flexibility here, which is that if the creator themselves, if the, if the D gods, you know, core team themselves decide, you know what, we can bring in revenue other places that we can use to drive this project and, and drive value back to the original holders. Um, I think that's okay, and that's an individual choice. Uh, I, I absolutely think it shouldn't be the expectation of projects writ large, though, for exactly the reasons you're talking about. And then the market can determine, like, as we're seeing, like, if a project has no royalties, is that just going to ruin the project? Because the, the holders are like, well, what's your incentive to keep building? Where are you getting the revenue from to deliver on your roadmap? Like, if, if those questions... Um, are important enough and are not answered in another way by a project, the market should reflect that. Not to take a, a deeply capitalist, um, like free market approach to this, but that's yeah, what I, take. I have like a, a pretty blunt take. Like the only people, in my opinion, who are calling for 0% royalties, if you want to do it as a brand and still build after you've taken VC money, by all means, it's, it's your prerogative. But I think the only people on the other side of the marketplace that are asking for this 
are degen flippers that are looking at their margins. Mm. And I've seen this narrative of, okay, as a project, if you're not delivering for holders, you need to remove royalties. But then my question would be, how are Why you expecting them trading? to build? Yeah. <laughs> what's the incentive for them to actually build? So you're removing incentive from them. I, I get those that have like started as a 0% royalty or sorry they've started as like a free mint and then built on royalties as well as a means of like proving themselves i think that is a more sustainable method than saying we're just going to remove the recurring revenue i also don't buy the like we need to find sustainable revenue streams newsflash like we haven't yet <laughs> like the the current model isn't we shouldn't remove royalties just because it's not sustainable we need to find other revenue streams on top of you know having royalties are you thinking like Web3 native uh, stream yeah, of income? Cause I, yeah, that aren't just like value extractive. I think what we've seen is the playbook is continue to dilute, continue to sell merch, find other ways to build out. I mean, it's capitalism. Find other ways to, to have your consumer purchase things that aren't necessarily value accretive to what really feel more like investors and consumers. And I know we can't technically say that, but- that, that's kind of the angle. So it, it's more about like, how do we find additional ways to build brands sustainably than taking away their revenue stream? Yeah, I think this is where I, I get to that place of like, humans are still humans. We, we can't like fundamentally defy the laws of physics for lack of a better term, yeah. simply because we have the blockchain, you know? So I'm like, we know how brands get built, you know, yes. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, we yeah. know, create good content that actually drives value to people's lives, create a community that drives value to people's lives. And then you can monetize, you know, the, the problem with monetizing with merch is if to your point, like it's, it's gimmicky or it's like, it's literally because the founding team just needs money. And so this is another way to just extract value, not yes. because you have an ethos that people resonate with so much. That they want to show it off in a sweatshirt that they wear out to a party with friends. Like there's, there's kind of value added merch and then there's value extractive merch. And totally. we see both, I think in this space, um, for sure. So yeah, I, I think it's a really good point that like the only people who really on, on the consumer level want this are flippers who aren't really additive to a community. I mean, liquidity adding is something I suppose. I do, right? I but, do think they're additive to a community. Sure. I, do, I do think there's a place for flippers. I just like that is, those are the people that are, I mean, they add a lot of, yeah, to your point, they add a lot of liquidity. liquidity. They're the ones like diving in and the bear is still, totally. you know, still here every day. But it's more of just like, that's the narrative that I'm seeing per perpetrated from flippers. I do have less of a problem on the project level with somebody determining, with D-God saying, hey, we're not gonna charge royalties than at the marketplace level. The marketplace level, forcing that on creators, I have a much bigger problem with than a creator taking that into their own hands. Okay, let's get to the proof of work piece. Give me your take. Yeah, so I have been a big proponent of building in public. It's very much how you build trust, transparency. This is like a radical, version of transparency. And I actually think it goes a little bit too far. Reason being is I think it misaligns incentives. If your main prerogative is showing progress every day, then you're going to show things that like keep the ball slightly moving instead of taking big swings. I also think that there is a time and place where you have longer initiatives that need to be obfuscated for whatever reason that you shouldn't be talking about. Um, and th that's totally okay. Like we want to be, I wrote about this a couple months ago, this idea of painkillers and vitamins. Painkillers are things that like you actually need, like you will die without. Vitamins are like nice to have. Vitamins are a lot easier to build in very short product cycles. Painkillers take a lot of time and it's not just the time to build it. It's the time to go research what is actually hurting people that you can build a unique solution for. And so you want to be able to like parallel track those. And I worry this going too far will just lead with a bunch of sugar water vitamins instead of building meaningful products. You don't think they can say spent three hours today with a team working on secret initiative that will take two years to pay out, pay out. Like you, you can probably report on that while obfuscating details. Sure, you probably can, but it, what if that becomes like working on secret project for like a week? Yeah, I can just speak to Venice, like when we built out like our payment engine, that was a six month project that totally. I was working on every single day. And so if the if the status update was, we're building a payment or you know we're building secret project every single day, 
it would rub people the wrong way. So just taking it like to the, the fullest extreme, it does make them vulnerable. I by and large like am a huge fan of this. It just it can go the other way pretty quickly. I think to me the concern is less the se- that secret project thing, right? Because if they're building a secret project for six months that they can't talk about, the community is going to be mad anyway, right? Sure. Like if they're not saying that in the update and they're just kind of not like we don't know what's going on. That that's what this whole you know whatever initiative was designed to combat was the fact that yeah maybe for six months you're building something you can't talk about it looks like you're doing nothing i mean god we saw it with doodles right they don't tweet for a month and it's like the entire world is coming to an end for (laughs) for doodles holders so i think in that scenario community members are mad either way this at least is showing something i think you can give more detail like hey you know met with a new potential dev for secret project today for an hour right like three whatever blah 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 so i I think i don't i don't think that's the concern at least to me as much my concern would more be on the shorter term sweet bursts or whatever as you're you're kind of describing them if you can be detailed about what you're spending your time doing now having community members who are going to nitpick the way in which sure you do the, do the short term and if like it's where you can actually provide more information that I think there can be a lot of nitpicking that it can just corrode a vision. You know, like yeah. you, there is an extent to which you have to keep blinders on and when you're building something and not let the outside world overly um, interfere with that. You know, and and I think there there can be an end vision that a whole bunch of people can share, but the path to that can look very different and different people can have different visions of what that path looks like. And if you try to appease all the visions, you'll never get to the end vision. You know, you need that like center person kind of driving that forward. That to me is it's where you can almost give more detail that I think you could you could see them losing their way because they're they're trying to appease the community. Now, Frank strikes me as savvy and as kind of like brazen and kind of willing to take shit and so the hope to me is that yeah we're opening this up but we're just going to go keep doing our thing this is just so you have visibility into what we're doing and like we're going to do it our way remains to be seen if that'll happen um but i I once had a i once worked at a job where i was required every day to send an email like saying what i'd done for the day and i i hate it i was like this is the most infantilizing exercise it's also like it takes me an hour to remember and write out everything I did today anyway, which is like a waste of my time. So I was like, personally, God bless them. I would never want to have to do this to, you know, a community of 3000 holders. But again, we would, I, I respect we would them do it in like boundaries. Slack. We would do it in yeah. Slack at the beginning of the day. It's like, OK, what did you work on yesterday? What are you working on today? It, it was very like haphazard in terms of engagement. I do agree. Like it, Frank just doesn't, doesn't strike me as the type of person that this is like a request for comment. It's just like, hey, this is what we're doing. Like, just so you like stay along. I'll be very curious to know, a, how many people know about this within even just like the D gods community and youth community, and b, how many people are actually looking like at checking it, checking up on I it, do th- totally. yeah, checking in on it. People are going to join after the announcement. Like, how are they making this like really clear? Where is it living? People are typically going to Twitter for their news, anyways. I do think you could end up with like a squeaky wheel problem where it's just a couple people who are paying attention and have a bunch of opinions and they're broadcasting those. So it's all about balance. Yeah. I have more I want to say, but I'm cognizant of the fact that we're 16 minutes into basically 30 minutes of covering. (laughs) Perfect. (laughs) And we've only (laughs) talked about news item number one. So I'm going to move us along, even though there's plenty more we could say. Um, We'll keep this one faster. Uh, Epic announced or Hadian announced a $30 million investment in a company called Hadian, which I wasn't familiar with until this news. I think you or or Maddie actually is the one who who pointed this out to me. Yeah. Um, The thing I want to flag is my... my sense, and we'll include the link to, to Hadian if people want to go check out the website, feels like Hadian is really just like an improbable competitor. I don't want to say that in case they're communicating for some sort of interoperability standards or something, but feels like they're also very focused on the, the problem improbable is focused on, which is how do we extend real world experiences into the metaverse? Feels less gaming focused and more conferences, concerts, events, it feels like the focus is more on that, which then inevitably means the focus is on how do we get 10,000 people in in a virtual experience at once where they're not broken out into different servers. And that's really the problem they're tackling. 
I don't know if you have a, a different take on this or just a take broadly, but. Yeah, and all my gaming friends, forgive me if I if I butcher this, but my, I had heard of Hadian through another former coworker who actually is partnering with them. They have a creator fund that they're investing in like metaverse type projects and they're building out digital avatars, super cool stuff. The way that I took it was that Epic is to Hadian what Unity is to Improbable. The idea essentially yeah. like they're very congruent in that if the game engines of today are Epic and Unity, the like infrastructure platforms of tomorrow are Haiti and Improbable. And so it seems like Epic taking the stake in Haiti and is very much like let's build a strong relationship here, let's share information. It just seems like a strategic partnership, no brainer. Like let's share yep. knowledge um, and let's be like, you know, mutually invested in the outcome of, of the metaverse. So I, I think it's a strong signal. It's Epic covering their bases. Um, they're the biggest game engine in the world right now. And so doubling down and, and building out for the metaverse seems like a, a natural step. Yeah, that makes total sense. I think one question that I actually just spoke with Tom Bilyeu, that episode will be coming out next week. He builds with Unreal, but we talked a little bit, though. I don't know if that portion of the conversation will actually air next week. We're going to we're going to air uh, some stuff, a, a little bit of a conversation with Tom Billy at a later uh, stage this year. Anyway, point being, he builds an Unreal, but was saying that there is a lot of conversation, it seems, or, or possibilities for, uh, you know, porting between Unreal and Unity engines, you know, so that you've got your kind of, as you're pointing out, which I think is a great way to frame it, your kind of improbable Unity on one side, and now it looks like Hadian Unreal on the other side, so that we can really have sort of a... a massively interoperable metaverse. So sort of asking him about his decision to go the Unreal route. Um, I'm also interested in the idea of Epic, for example, and then maybe it's improbable on the other side. But um, yeah, like really wrapping everybody who builds in Unreal in sort of one massive metaverse experience. So you have all these like individual metaverses being built out and then what an Unreal themselves will do to really facilitate that like... Um, I don't know, facilitate experiences that go across all these different metaverses that are being built within their their engine, I think is interesting. Yeah, my hope is that we get, it's going to take the engines building some sort of unified protocol. This isn't the early days of the internet where you had like a group of, although it is, it is happening to some extent, where a bunch of like metaverse groups come together and create a uniform like standard by which like how do you view objects how does a shirt look in one format versus another like how do you code for that so my hope is like you see the engines actually start to build that standard Improbable's I think it's definitely yeah. looking towards that I know other side right. like th th with I've their other side SDK, partnership I think yeah. in particular they're really trying to create standards in in objects and all and all the rest of it I, you know, I'm not technical enough to speak to it well but it does feel like the players in this space, it's not just lip service, like interoperability is really a, also just a key part of their business plans. Like it makes sense from a business yeah. perspective, if you're that infrastructure layer to make it super portable because, you know, you, you, for obvious reasons, I guess it's just it's growth. Um, OK, the Decentraland user debate while we talk about metaverses, <laughs> it feels like it's worth. I don't think again, I don't think we have to spend uh, hours on this. It's it's pretty straightforward. It is kind of funny. You had a. Uh, Concata, again, just going to pretend I know how to say that, um, tweeting out that the Decentraland metaverse had 20 active users in the past 24 hours. Uh, and then uh, I think that got some traction. And then you had Decentraland with like kind of a weird tweet, in my opinion, sort of negating that. And ultimately, after like several different tweets being like, as stated in this Coindesk article, we have 8,000 daily active users. But they didn't like just come out and say they had a certain number of daily active users. They sort of were like, here's our monthly active user number and here's a bunch of other numbers. And then like four tweets down, we're going to refer to a Coindesk article to say that we have 8,000 daily active users, which just makes it sound like they don't have that. It doesn't matter. Like, yeah. it doesn't matter. It's so much lower than it needs to be. <laughs> like, and whether that, it's 50 yes. or 8,000, it, do, it really doesn't matter. For reference for people, Roblox has, like, 200 million. Like, it's a completely different ball game that they're trying to build into. And so, yeah, the fact that we're t even talking under the scale of, like, millions right now should be, like, red flags. Like, how are you going to get people to build to an empty party? And I think this is honestly... 
a result of focusing on like building for land for the sake of like owning real estate without there being a sense of like anything to do there. Like, yep. I see all these nothing burger partnerships. It's like, cool. But like, what are you going to actually do to like hang out in these spaces? Why am I going to spend time here? Yeah. And I, I've been on this kick, obviously, for a while. Anybody who listens to the show has heard me talk about it somewhat ad nauseum. I feel like I reference it in, in so many episodes of the show, which is like skeptical of the land sale model. Roblox being the perfect example of a platform that very much did not have land sales. In fact, I think in early days, they like paid users in, in whatever capacity, whether it was through like, you know, just coins, Robux or whatever it was. I don't think they were paying people literal dollars. Right. But like to bootstrap that original community to get those network effects and to get kind of the best creators to build on there so that it became, you know, a fun interactive, you go and play Roblox with your friends and go visit their amusement park or whatever you build. Right. And, um, we're seeing the opposite approach in like yeah. web three metaverses, which is like this weird skeuomorphic thing where you like tr treat land like it's scarce, even though you don't have to. And that's actually feels like one of the benefits of the metaverse versus the real world. And it, very strange. I totally agree. That was sort of my conclusion, too. It's like this is such a silly debate anyway, because 8000 also is a terrible number. I think um, the Decentraland, I, I sort of talked to some folks who have been talking to folks at Decentraland. The, the sentiment seems to be from them like, look, the classic, like we're building for the long term. We're not worrying about daily active users right now because we want to build something bigger these very immersive sure. an immersive game is going to take three to five years realistically or two to three whatever it's going to take time and so they're laser focused on that and they're not really paying attention to right now on a day-to-day -day level how many people do they have on the platform yeah but ultimately if this isn't a place that is fun or people want to spend time with or take value from i, I agree with like the land sale model and i i pray that i'm wrong because i am hemorrhaging other deeds right now but <laughs> it's very much like focused again on value extraction which just feels like antithetical to what we're trying yes. to build here like we're trying to bring people together and build new experiences for ownership but instead we're just like effectively using them as like a seed round and then yeah. saying like, check back in <laughs> in a couple of years. And what's more is if your metaverse is built at all on the concept of UGC, you want to be rewarding your most engaged, your best yes. builders. You yes. don't want to be rewarding the people who happen to be available on a Saturday night for like another deed auction or whatever, right? Like who may yeah. or may not actually create value in your ecosystem. And that already sets you off on this weird foot where you're beholden to the people who bought the land as opposed to the people who are doing the most to make it a fun place to be. So um, anyways, go, go check out my land sale episode. Maybe we'll link to that too if you want to hear <laughs> some of the potential solutions for this problem. All right, we'll maybe dive a little deeper into this one. The Vault by CNN news that came out. Yeah. Um, is this a rug? I feel like that's sort of the question that I'd love for us to, to talk through. Um, high level CNN Vault, which I didn't even know about. I think probably plenty of people in this space hadn't even freaking heard of. Um, launched in June of last year and uh, was really just a play on like the NBA Top Shop moments thing. I, I think it's actually a, a cool premise. The premise was you can own like a CNN moment, which is, you know, them breaking news on some big world event. It's sort of like own historical moments in the way that people own NBA Top Shop moments. Again, I think there's something interesting there. Um, but clearly it was it was uh, it has not gone well. And they have announced they will not be doing more. What is your feeling? Is this a rug? Yeah, I don't think so. I, I yeah, This is something I wrote about as well. Like we have to allow people to fail it or even just like completely view it from the perspective of, you know, CNN was very deliberate in saying, hey, this was supposed to be an experiment for X amount of time. And the reaction to it led us to continue to invest. But the market changed. And so we're taking a step back and we're going to end this program for now. I think that's totally OK if we want more mainstream consumers and brands to get on board, we have to give them a two-way door. This can't be a, like, you're committed to this forever and or else you're a rugger and we're never going to support anything you do again. I think they, from my understanding of the press release, like they did write by holders. It's not like they didn't deliver on anything that they promised. So yeah, maybe I'm taking a, a different, do you disagree? I'll, I'll, I'll take the, I'll take the co contrary sure. stance on this. N not because I think it is a rug either. I don't think this is like something in, in 
there's not like intentional malice here, but to push back a little bit, I think um, they didn't ever say in the beginning that it was a six week experiment. They did mm. six weeks of drops. So you could. So I'm sure that was something internally for them that they were like, oh, yeah, we'll see how this goes. But they didn't like make that public. Uh, I, I let me get the dates here. But like a couple months ago, they published their 2022 roadmap. There was implications that or not even implications. There was something directly that there was going to be some sort of election night utility, like mm. November 8th. There was going to be some utility. So, like, I do think this is a classic example of you have a, a big organization that's very Web2 that clearly is like during the bull market. Yeah, like we should get into this thing. They were pitched on this idea of moments by Dapper or whoever pitched it. Right. And they were like, cool. Yeah, sounds interesting. They hired some external to CNN team to run this for them because they didn't have the capabilities. So it wasn't like a core endeavor within the CNN, you know, war room, so to speak. They kept it going because there was some success there and probably because the team they hired was like, it's Web3. It really is important that you like have utility and that you engage the community and blah, blah, blah. So they kind of <laughs> kept saying yes. They have a change in leadership amidst in the middle of all of this. Right. They have this acquisition. A lot of things change. CNN Plus disappears. Mm -hmm. And and then they have this sort of ex this team that's sort of still pushing it, saying, oh, we're going to do this stuff as they really start to think about brass tacks. What does it require on the CNN team's part to deliver on some November 8th promise? CNN's like, forget it, pull the plug. And they, what they've done to compensate holders is to is to give them like a 20 percent rebate on whatever like the purchase price of their NFT was or the or the floor price or something like that, which is um fine. I, I think given everything and given that they raised all of about $300,000 from this, which is even by failing cable news standards, not that much money. They yeah. should just refund holders who want to be refunded. It's yeah. like this 20%, just give them the money back. It's $300,000 or they're about yeah. like, just, you know, that would have actually, I think, been the right corporate move on their part. The other right corporate move would have been to, from the outset, not committed to utility and said, these are historical art like moments that's the value they can provide. And I, I feel like they were probably like suckered into the utility stuff by a Web3 firm that genuinely was trying to be like, this is what the community wants, that you need utility. And and it really fell apart. So long rant there. But I would say I do think there they have a little bit more blame to take than they didn't really just say, hey, this is just a six week experiment and sure. then like pull out, you know. Hey, but we made it longer than CNN Plus, so Web3 we, natives out there. The N Vaults <laughs> and the NFT project made it longer than CNN Plus. And by the way, nobody in the mainstream is being like, streaming's dead because Netflix yeah. is down 97% and CNN Plus shuttered its doors. So, you know, I think uh, totally. All right. Well, lots we didn't get to get to. Maybe we'll, we'll do some sort of like bonus episode. But because we have Jeremy here, I do want to turn it over. Jeremy Goldman, you've been on the podcast before talking to us about uh, IP law and what's happened with, you know, with IP rights when it comes to, to NFTs. You are now back on the show to uh, talk to us about what's going on with this new SEC probe into Board Ape Yacht Club. Jeremy, thank you so much for joining. Thanks, Carly, for having me. And uh, yeah, I, I came on to talk about intellectual property and true, that is my bread and butter uh, and Web3 and NFTs um, and all things surrounding it. And uh, I'm saying that because I, I do want to give the disclaimer. I am a lawyer, so I can't do the a, the I anal, the very strange acronym. I am not a lawyer. I am a lawyer, oh. and I am a. <laughs> no, I've not heard that one. <laughs> no, I, people do this all the time. I a n a l. I am not a lawyer. I thought it was a very strange twist, but I am a lawyer. Okay. Um, and but I and and I am in uh, somebody who's very familiar with the NFT industry and with the Web three industry. Uh, and because of that, I have to be familiar with this, you know, things that come up in the industry and arise in the industry. I'm not a securities lawyer. There's a lot of, you know, sort of crypto lawyers out there that have been focused on securities issues. Uh, I'm, you know, really focused more on NFTs and content and media, which I think it aligns with your audience. But I am really happy to talk about, uh, you know, my take and my, my spin or not spin, but my take and opinion on the the news, if you want to call it that, that came out recently about the SEC and NFTs. Perfect. I, I know you well enough to know you will do it ex extremely well. You know a hell of a lot more than, than myself or the audience. And so I, I think there'll be a lot to learn here. I think we should start with just like 
A breakdown about what we know about this probe so far, it has felt vague to me. Like it's one of the founders that's being probed, not Yuga Labs as a company seems to be what the headlines are implying. I, I'm seeing a lot of things about like, it's a dis- it's like a disclosure thing and, and which makes me feel like, all right, if this is just about like Web3 companies needing to give more disclosures when they issue an NFT, I think that's a huge win, you know? Like, what are we really talking about? What do we know about this right now? Yeah, so the news that came out this last week, you know, I, you know, we know very little uh, and, and frankly, you know, I'll, I'll break it down, but I think it very well could be a nothing burger specifically. Of course, the, the Securities and Exchange Commission has been looking at the crypto industry and digital assets for many years. And um, the most recent news uh, broke from Bloomberg from a reporter named Matt Robinson. And you know, in March, all the way back in March, Matt Robinson put out a story, I'm looking at it right now on my screen, SEC scrutinizes NFT market over illegal crypto token offerings. Uh, you know, regulator is probing whether some of the assets are securities. Agencies, enforcement lawyers have sent out query subpoenas. That's back in March. We're now in October. Now, if when I when I learned this news back in March and I saw this news that the SEC was sending out queries and subpoenas around NFTs, that was not at all surprising to me. I think that didn't shouldn't have surprised anyone that the Securities and Exchange Commission was looking at all digital assets and all digital tokens and you know, they haven't brought any enforcement actions directly against any anyone so far. Um, but I also, when I saw that, like, yeah, you know, if you if you're aware of this industry, the notion that, you know, Yuga Labs uh, wouldn't have been on that list of folks that received inquiries related to NFTs was sort of to me to me anathema, right? Like, of course, the biggest players in the space are going to be receiving subpoenas, even if they're not targets of an investigation, even if they are not implicated in anything, uh, I would think that Yuga came out would be would be part of that. So now in October, really the only additional news that I'm aware of is that in terms of the the list of folks that received inquiries from the SEC, and we don't really know, you know, the way that this was written, it's like, is it a query? Is it a subpoena? Is it a letter? You know, we don't know. The only sort of news that really came out is, well, the the people behind the board ABI club, the Yuga Labs people, were on that list, uh, and you know, again, you know, news wants to make news and wants people to get excited, and 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 by the way, this is an important issue. The, you know, the issue of securities and tokens and how NFTs fit in, totally an interesting question and something we should discuss. But the only news right now is like, oh, the the biggest name in the business happens to be on that list. And now in October, they're putting that out there. Yeah. So your point is like, if you've been properly paying attention, you already kind of knew this was happening. This could just be like, a. I mean, the SEC is clearly trying to make a show. I mean, it feels like we're in this turf war between the SEC and the C- CTFC, you know, of like who gets to regulate this stuff. And, you know, this could just be a headline in like a shot fired across the bow of that turf war. Nothing about this itself is actually particularly revelatory. Yeah, you're absolutely seeing a lot of jockeying between government agencies about who's going to be the the chief enforcement officer when it comes to various classes of digital assets. You know, the the you know the CFTC is the commodities. Uh, uh, I, you know, I always the, mix it up. I'm like dyslexic yeah. with the words CTFC versus CFTC. Trading Commission and. Um, and, and the SEC, which deals with securities, and it's like, well, the IR, and the IRS, by the way, and the Department of Justice, they all could potentially have, and even the Postal Service got in on the game. And one of the, in the cases, the one against Frosties, uh, that, was the, that was the US Postal Service that did the big investigation there. So you do have this jockeying, and there's sort of like a social media influencer buzziness about it. Um, you know, Gensler, uh, you know, recently came out, I think, you know, it was featured on a couple of the podcasts, maybe yours, that, you know, Gensler put out this really cringy uh, video about, you know, influencers, you know, shilling uh, tokens. And it wasn't, you know, to me, a coincidence that, you know, out of all of the people that they went after, it was Kim Kardashian Kim. Yeah. Right, that they went after. And, you know, those are those are news headlines. And I do find it interesting here that this anonymous source that tipped you know, apparently tipped uh, Mr. Robinson, the reporter, off to the fact that 
Yuga was on this list. It was just Yuga that was mentioned. Like, yeah, it's Gary. Our- Gary yeah. is the anonymous source. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, Guaranteed, I saw- it's like somebody in Gary Gensler's camp that is the anonymous yeah. source tipping off Bloomberg. But you know, look, no one's no one's been accused of anything. Uh, we know that this is a probe. It's an investigation. I think that you know, regulators um, like the SEC, they have broad powers to ask questions, and when they ask questions, you know, people sort of prioritize that almost above everything else to answer those questions, especially a company like uh, that's a big, reputable and trying to follow the law company. And so they're just figuring out what to do. So go ahead, Carly. We don't need to overreact to this bit of news then itself, which is great. But we do know that something is coming, right? Like clearly the way it's been isn't sustainable and frankly shouldn't probably be sustained. Again, I think having some rules outlined about if you issue an NFT, here are some disclosures you need to make, here's some information you need to provide would actually be probably good for the space and fantastic for preventing against rug pulls. So let's talk about, there's kind of two different cases here and Yuga emblemizes this well, right? Because you have ApeCoin, which is an ERC-20 and probably where there's more risk. And then you have the NFT side. And, and to me, if if something were, if, if NFTs themselves, if these pieces of artwork, if these monkey JPEGs were to be regulated like securities, that would be really devastating and a terrible legal call. And, and so let's save that for the second part. And let's just do, do a, a quick piece here on the ApeCoin itself. Yuga, it feels to me, like took every precaution possible to, um, to, to not draw the ire or, or the, the uh, decision that ApeCoin is, is in is a security. And they did that by, from the outset, being like, there's this DAO, it's not controlled by Yuga at all, it's a decentralized control, we've got these board members, whatever, and they are the issuers and the overseers of ApeCoin, this token. And my assumption was they were trying to create that distance so you couldn't say that ApeCoin was somehow representative of, you know, the the, uh, security... if Yuga Labs does well, ApeCoin will inevitably do well. You know, like creating that distance between Yuga Labs, the company, and the coin itself. Can you speak to that? Do you think that that is that what they were doing? Is that an effective strategy? What are some of the possible ways that the SEC comes down on ApeCoin? I think that the question of of ApeCoin, you know, ApeCoin raises it was an ERC twenty token, right? It's a it's a fungible token, and that's where the regulatory environment has been the most uncertain. As you said, it's the most sort of risky. And, you know, if if this SEC probe is about the ERC-20 token, then I, you know, my, my feeling and opinion on it is, yeah, like I could talk about it, but frankly, like there's people that could much better talk about, you know, whether ERC-20 tokens and, you know, fungible tokens that are, Um, that are out there, you know, constitute securities or not securities. Um, But if that's what this is about, then this is a true nothing burger for the NFT market. Because we've known for a very long time that the SEC has viewed various ICOs, various coin offerings, various meme coins, um, and, and really Gensler has come out and said, you know, with, and I don't agree with this position at all, but that, you know, any ERC-20 token, in my view, says Gensler is a security. Now, I, I disagree with this view, uh, but that's the view that they've taken. And I think the efforts of the industry have been, how do we structure uh, our token offerings in a way that you know, complies with, or does that so that it does not constitute a security? Is it, is it sufficiently decentralized? Is it not being offered as an investment opportunity? Are we creating distance between the uh, you know, the issuer of the token and the, and the sort of the pool of assets that gets created through? Those are all, you know, really good questions, and there's been a lot of different, you know, ways that people have gone about it. And I think that, you know, again, I'm not the one to really weigh in on this. I think that the, you know, the ApeCoin and and lots of other projects have been extremely thoughtful about how they go about it in a way to try to protect consumers to not be a security. Um, but I just don't think that should really be like that's not the news here. I mean, to me, the news and the thing to talk about is, and I don't even think it's Yugen specifically, I think the news is like, well, what is the SEC going to do about NFTs? And when might an NFT project, a non-fungible project with art and digital collectibles, when might those types of projects run into trouble? Let me ask one question before we go to that, though, because it, there is, there, there will clearly be an impact, I would imagine, on like board Ape NFTs, for example, if ApeCoin is deemed a security and something 
really terrible happens to ApeCoin. You know, there's there's clearly people who have done this or companies that have done this better and worse. You saw the, the SEC really went or the CFTC, I guess, really went after UkiDAO, who had had like a central coin that they then tried to, after the fact, decentralize via a DAO, which I think is in, in contrast to what Yuga did, which was starting it off as decentralized, which in, to me should be a more compelling reason to not make it a security. Can you speak to, though, what what if the SEC and Gary Gensler do determine that ApeCoin is a security what happens? Is ApeCoin shut down? Is it just fines levied against Yuga? What happens? I mean, I can speak. I can speak generally that if you know, if a you know, if any particular token is uh, you know, if there's injunctions issued by by the SEC or a court uh, and says that you know this coin needs to stop, I think the most and I and I'm not speaking specifically about ApeCoin here. I would say generally any co- coin, any token. Really, you know, because it's a decentralized network, there's only so much that any regulator or any person can do, and even mm. the initial issuer can do to stop trading. But I think the point would be, let's be practical, would say the SEC, would say a court, would say the, the issuer and their lawyers. They'd say, whatever we can do, we could do within our control. So things like, well, the main exchanges, at least the centralized exchanges, they're going to, they have to delist this, this currency. Right. And that's what's happened. There's, you know, centralized exchanges um, have delisted many currencies that have been deemed securities and have been sort of, you know, then taken off those exchanges and then they end up, you know, basically being sucked of value. Um, But, you know, there's only so much you can do to stop it. There's still people that are on the proof of work network from Ethereum. There's still people that are on ETH 1.0. All right. So, like, there's only so much that you can do to stop trading of a particular asset. Um, a digital asset in a decentralized world. I'm not convinced, Carly, that you know, Ape, ApeCoin is is a different. It's a different entity that that sort of runs that. There's a foundation. It's it's it is separate. There's you know, obviously like the way that ApeCoin. There is like a connection between ApeCoin and and the board apes. But to me, what makes NFT special is that they are non fungible, and I do believe that they have intrinsic value in and of themselves. So I am. I, I you said something that I just. I'm not sure that I agree with, which is that if if there were to be something going on with the fungible token, I don't know what kind of impact that would have on the non-fungible token. I mean, certainly whenever there's the FUD, whenever there's the fear, uncertainty, doubt, you know, injected into the market, you know, the market responds. But I don't know that there's any real economic basis for for that for that correlation. I think the the case would be if Yuga's broad vision is we are going to become effectively a metaverse at which board apes themselves are at the center, mutant apes are at the center, and ape coin is the is the the currency for that. If you take out one legs of that tripod, you know, the the whole vision is sort of rocked in a way that I think rocks every part of that vision. I think you make a good point though, which is that doesn't necessarily stand long term. Okay, so then, you know, insert new kind of currency monetary system to to the metaverse and in the long term, these non-fungible tokens stand it's also, on their own. I just want to remind, like this is not, there is no indication that I'm aware of that anything that the SEC is doing has anything to do with that, right? So the only, again, the only, just going back to what the news is and what we know about this, like we can speak in hypotheticals and like, but I don't think there's anything new right now. Like we could have had the same exact conversation, Carly, when ApeCoin came out in the first place. There's nothing about the fact right. that the SEC is looking into the NFT market that suggests that there's some something happening with ApeCoin or that they're being accused of ApeCoin being a problem. Like this is all just, you know, we could say the same thing about literally, this is an industry problem. Like the same conversation, yes, we people often bring up Yuga and apes because they're sort of top of the list. And so it's a good, you know, framework to talk about things, but the SEC, the SEC inquiry into NFTs, the, the issue of what constitutes a security in terms of digital assets, the impact that fungible tokens have on non-fungible tokens, these are industry-wide issues mm-hmm. that yep. affect the entire industry. I think it's a good point. I am looking at the Coindesk article about this that that did say the SEC is also reportedly looking into how eight coins, the Ethereum-based governance, blah, blah, blah tokens, were distributed to holders of Board Ape Yacht Club, Mutant Ape Yacht Club, and Boyard Ape Kennel Club members. Um, so there is something there kind of tied into it, but I understand your point is like, yeah, but there's nothing new. Like we always known, have known this is this is a question. So let's talk about the NFT part of this, which is what are some of the 
potential scenarios here, maybe from like the most benign scenario you see when it comes to the SEC's determinations around NFTs to maybe the, the most onerous scenario that you could you could imagine? Yeah, I think that the most uh, I, I think that the most benign uh, scenario is that, well, the most benign, most lenient would be to not bring any enforcement actions against any NFT projects that don't have any element of fraud or, or scam or, or sort of, you know, um, bad behavior. And so far, that's really the only place that we've seen regulatory activity, and it's quite nice, right? So you have situation where there's bad actors, and like the Frosty's situation, according to the complaint, would be a good example of that. Or a, a situation potentially involving like insider trading, I'm you're putting a bunny quotes around it because, you know, insider trading is often associated with securities, and let's assume they're not securities, um, then it wouldn't maybe wouldn't be insider trading, but the idea of you know people using information to their advantage to the disadvantage of the consuming public. So I think that the most sort of uh, hands off laissez faire approach here would be let's go after the fraud. Let's go after people that are you know pu like pumping something up with no real intention. I know I, I heard your conversation with Austin before about CNN, and you know you both agreed this wasn't a rug pull. Right, whether or not it was a, a good business move, bad business move, they decided to shut it down. What they should do to make it right for people that got into it, fine. But they weren't. There's no indication that they were acting in bad faith or that they were trying to scam anyone. And so I think that the low-hanging fruit to me would be just let's go after the people that are actually trying to take advantage and leave alone the people that are, are in good faith, trying to make artwork trying to you know, create digital assets that people can trade and get, it, get on top of. And if they end up losing money on it, like they knew that they could lose money on buying a collectible. Um, that to me would be the most laissez-faire approach. How likely do you think that approach is from them? I think that that level of leniency is unlikely. Uh, you know, I think that it will, that level of leniency, I think, is the hallmark for most NFT projects. What I mean by that is, look, most people, and this is none of this, of course, is legal advice, but you know, most people just don't get chased by the SEC. There's like, you know, hundreds and thousands of people doing business, millions of people doing business, and lots of people doing business in crypto. Very few of them are ever gonna have the eye of Sauron on top of them, right? Like they just don't have the attention for that and the resources for that. So most, so like, you know, when I'm advising clients, it's like, number one, don't, don't be, don't do bad stuff, right? Like don't be evil, don't scam people. I think the more likely approach and what I think I could end up happening is a, a project that has all of the hallmarks of a digital token offering, like an ERC 20 token offering. That's all the hallmarks of an investment security that as, as determined by the SEC, where, where the project markets itself as an investment opportunity, where the project says, we're gonna use these funds to do really cool stuff that's gonna ignore back to your benefit. The most obvious would be like, we're gonna share the profits with you NFT holders. Everything that happens with the NFT project sort of tracks the same elements that occurred in the digital fungible token cases, but there's a JPEG attached to it. And, you know, and they say, no, 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 we're different because we have we have JPEGs, we have art. And, you know, in those cases, I think the SEC would say, we don't care that there's a JPEG attached to it. We don't care that it's non fungible and that one token isn't the same as the next. You're you're following all of the same the same playbook and where you're, you have the potential to harm consumers and potential investors in the same way that the digital, the, the fungible tokens do in our view. So I think I could see that, right? Where a project has all the hallmarks of a fungible token offering, but they have a JPEG attached to it. And I could see them saying, we don't care. That doesn't change anything that if there's a JPEG. I talk to a lot of creatives who, you know, are using JPEGs as a way to fund their creative endeavors with the intent, whether explicitly stated or not, to share in the spoils should that artistic work film, book, whatever, right, be successful. Is that this kind of case you're talking about that you think the SEC is likely to say, hey, this is a security, we don't care that there are pictures associated with it? I think that all of these cases that when you're determining whether 
a uh, there's a sec- an investment scheme, and you're determining whether uh, something constitutes a security, which is another way of saying two two ways of saying the same thing. They're highly fact specific, and there's a real facts and circumstances uh, analysis that has to be done. So you know, for example, you said, Carl, you said they you know they they imply or they express that they're going to share in the spoils with people, right? Well, that matters. Like, how did they how did they market the project? What were they telling people at the outset? That's a, a huge factor because when what one of the key factors is was there an expectation of profits? So it's one thing to say you're buying this digital piece of art, and you think you're buying a digital piece of art, and then all of a sudden you get a, a gift, right? You get an airdrop, you get a gift, and I, again, not legal advice. I'm not saying this is it because it, it's facts and circumstances, but that's very different than saying. If you buy this NFT, I'm going to take this money. I'm going to go build something. I'm going to go take the the JPEGs. I'm going to put them and make a derivative project. I'm going to go make a video game out of them. I'm going to go make a movie out of them, and I'm going to sell it to Netflix. I'm going to take that money, and I'm going to share it with you. And then again, facts and circumstances. When I say I'm going to share that money with you, does that mean I'm going to give it to you like a dividend, like you would with a stock? Or does it mean I'm going to take that money, I'm going to put it into a treasury, that everyone holds, no one's allowed to get dividends from it, but then you can use that treasury to fund additional projects that I wanna do, so you can, and you'll get early access to my content, right? So those are two very different models and they have to be viewed very differently through the securities law lens. This whole conversation drives me crazy and I've said it so much and Austin and I have talked about it a bunch, I know, like it's just so, I've used this word now twice in this episode, infantilizing, like it's ridiculous that you can go as a consumer to Vegas and blow it all on black, if you so choose, you can go into any you know convenience store and buy as many lottery tickets as you want, but you can't bet on the artists you want if they're explicitly telling you, no, I'm just going to give you money returns if this thing sells, which is not guaranteed. It's such weird logic. And I understand that there is, I think, a genuine desire to protect consumers behind that logic. Like, I'm not not doubting that, but, you know, I can get a Foxwoods commercial during the Super Bowl telling me to come to their casino and like have the time of my life, but I can't have somebody, it's, I find it really I, silly. Well, <laughs> I mean, you're, you're, you're right. And gambling is a highly regulated industry. You know, Foxwoods has to comply with a tremendous volume of regulation to do what they do. And lotteries are only run by states that are highly regulated industries. So you're, you're right. Um, and, and I go back to sort of my, the lenient approach, which is, you, you know, a lot of it is just doing away with the bad actors. If, if like every artist was working in good faith and you had, and, and there was comfort that people weren't, you know, terrible, but you know, humans over and time again have, cho- have shown that we're awful left to our own devices. So I'm not, I'm not saying that you're wrong because I think that this is this industry where we have the ability to create more art. And that's why I believe that there are models and I do believe that there are ways that we can use this technology to fuel arts, fuel creativity and allow consumers to benefit in a safe way. So this is a question for for me as well. That laissez-faire version to me is not necessarily the best outcome from the standpoint that I do think it would be good to have some guidance as to what's acceptable, what's not, even change the rules from what they are to to maybe more laissez-faire rules with a bunch of guideposts like a super regulated gambling industry say. Um Do you agree? Like, do you think the SEC, you know, putting forth the new set of standards, just like a public company needs to issue it, you know, all all sorts of reporting, whatever. You can't just port that over to the NFT industry. We can't just say whatever a public company, whatever Coke, Coca-Cola has to report on to its shareholders. Now, NFT companies do. That wouldn't make any sense. It doesn't fit. But some version of that, would that be ideal in your mind? Yeah, and and look, the the SEC moves very slowly, and it you know there was I think it was back in only in in the year two thousand. The Ex- Securities and Exchange Act was passed in nineteen thirty three or nineteen thirty four. There's sort of like two two sets of it, um, and then in I think the year two thousand or so, there was the Jobs Act that enabled crowdfunding as an exception to the SEC disclosure requirements, where if you were only raising a certain amount of money and uh, you comply with certain other requirements, you can go and crowdfund a project without the level of onerous disclosures that you need to do with with your your typical public offering. I think what you're describing 
is something that's akin to a crowdfunding type regulation. And I think it makes a lot of sense were they to do something like that. To date, the SEC would say, you know what? We did put out guidance. Uh, in 2019, they published a paper. It's a sort of a framework on securities and digital assets. Really was not about NFTs with no surprise there. It was just about digital assets in general. But that paper does provide a fair number of elements and frameworks and guidance to help, you know, help advise companies and clients and projects in terms of what might constitute a security and what doesn't. But your point is a very good one, Carly, that what really the industry could use is a safe harbor. And there's been proposals to do things like that, to have safe harbors for both fungible as digital assets and for non-fungible ones. Uh, there's like the Loomis Gillibrand sort of proposal, which is like, give us some, you know, there's, there's these different proposals to have a safe harbor um, for uh, these digital assets. And I think that's something that could really be used. Like if we make these certain disclosures and, and you make it reasonable and comport with the industry, then uh, we have a safe harbor, as long as it turns out that what we said was a, a true representation. Last two questions, I guess one, can you give the quick bullet points of that 2019 digital asset guidance that they did set forward? Because I don't think, I think people in the industry feel like we've gotten nothing, you know, and, and it's maybe not entirely true. And then the last question would be your advice to ape holders. What should they be looking out for? Should It sounds like they shouldn't be so nervous, not any more nervous than they have been previously, but but would love to get your advice for them. Yeah, I mean, let me let me start with the, well, I'll answer them in, in order because uh, you're, you're the host. So I'll answer them exactly as you wanted them. And the, the paper is called um, the Framework for Investment Contract. There's the bunny ears, but it actually is the quotes. Um, investment Contract Analysis of Digital Assets. And, you know, what they say is that at the, whenever you're doing an analysis of, uh, of whether a particular uh, scheme or whether a particular, you know, whether a particular offering is a security, you, you know, people and a lot of people on your podcast are aware of this, uh, unbelievably, this old Supreme Court case called called Howie. Um, and Howie is the it's like a 1946 Supreme Court case. It always I, I love this because, you know, you have like these people in their like, you know, in their 20s that like don't know a dang thing about, you know, anything in the world. No offense, I mean, they're sometimes very brilliant and whip rich, but they know this 1946 Supreme Court case. Like why, why do they know about this case? It's amazing because this case sets out what the factors are, which is essentially um, that you are making at, you know, when there's an investment of money with the expectation of profits based solely on the efforts of others um, in order to make those profits. That's sort of the, by that standard, though, a baseball card wouldn't pass that test, right? It's that's what I meant. It's like when you one of the things one of one, a guy who I don't always agree with, but a very smart professor uh, named Brian Fry, he once said, and I thought it was great. He goes, what, "What's a, his definition of an SEC of a security is an, a security is whatever the SEC says is a security, <laughs> right?" Because oh really, boy, you can, really, uh -oh. you, can really, you can really squint your eyes. And, and almost turn anything that you buy into a security. I think that if we really got into it, we could explain why baseball cards are not, but things like baseball cards have been challenged before um, as securities. I think digital co collectibles in general, physical collectibles in general, have not been treated as securities. And I think there's no reason why digital collectibles that are functionally equivalent as a physical security would be should be treated as security. So that kind of, just to, preview on my, my answer about the, the apes, I, I don't think they should be worried because I don't believe that digital collectible projects, again, industry issue, I don't believe that digital collectible projects um, should be treated as securities. When, when you, just to, just to dig into it a little bit, you know, they go through uh, the different factors that I just mentioned, and I, by they, I mean the SEC, and they're, they're, they're looking at things like decentralization. They're looking at things like are what are you buying for your money? Are you buying sort of some invest, some expectation that you're going to get money back, or are, is is the suggestion that you're paying money and you're going to get some products and services? That's why you're buying. You think you might get some products and services, and that the value might be tied to that. Is the value tied to the intrinsic media or content that's being associated with it? And when I look at these factors, I start thinking, oh, okay. This actually does fit in some ways a lot of the NFT projects that offer, you know, a collectible, like a digital piece of digital art, and they offer utility. They offer sort of products, services, access, intangible rights 
that are it's sort of baked into why people want this asset. You know, in addition to just the scarcity itself, uh, you know, I think that's that's also um, tied to it. So if, if you look at this report, it has a lot of bullet points in these different categories. And I think it is useful if somebody's you know purchasing NFTs, if somebody is thinking about issuing NFTs and wants to and, and wants to sort of do it, do this in an innovative way and wants to know where the the bounds are, you can look at this report. Of course, you should consult a lawyer uh, and, and uh, you know, not do anything without uh, proper legal advice. But I think the SEC would say, well, this framework's a good start. They've got to update it. This was 2019. This is before NFTs were mainstream. So it doesn't capture and recognize uh, the realities of what NFTs are. And so I think the SEC would be, you know, really doing the the industry a service and would be doing consumers a service by issuing an updated guidance that is specific to NFTs and even better, coming out with a set of rules and disclosures that could safe harbor uh, NFT project creators so they have certainty about where the, the guardrails are. Awesome. And so that, that sort of tees us up for the, the, you sort of said it there, like, don't worry too much, ape holders. It seems like anybody rational looking at this, I think, sees that these the majority of these, your or your your board apes, for example, fall more in the category of a baseball card than they do Coca Cola stock. It's, it's just look. It sort of goes back to what I started with. Like this is an industry issue. If if like if the ape holders, the people that own the board apes, are are like have something to be worried about, then the entire NFT industry has something to be worried about. Well, I you think know, that's what we're all worried about. <laughs> well, well, fine, but it's not. I, I and and. That's that's fine, but I don't think that this news, the fact that the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission is looking into NFTs, which we've known about since March, uh, and and the fact that they're looking into it at all is just not newsworthy. Um, of course, they're looking into it. Of course, the government is looking into this nascent industry with a lot of trading going on. Um, and they're very interested in crypto in general, and this is part of the crypto market. And so, you know, this is not something in my mind, there's been no accusations made, there's been no specific claims, complaints, um, people named. Uh, it's just right now news that, you know, NFT projects, including not surprisingly, the biggest name in the business is getting questions from the SEC about this, this industry. And uh, that's that's OK. Like, OK, we'll, we'll tell you about it. And I think that our job um, as lawyers and, and people like yourself, Carly, is to, and, and Austin is to to educate the public. And because honestly, these regulators work for us, um, you know, that we, we other them. But they're like, you know, they're they're This is our we pay for them. This is our tax dollars to protect ourselves. And it's our job uh, to, to educate the public and, and that ultimately rises up to the regulators so that we protect the public. Um, and I don't think there's there is need for protection, but it needs to be done in the right way. Thank you so much, Jeremy. I appreciate you hopping on, quelling the nerves around this and, uh, and helping to break it down. I'm sure we'll have you on again at some point here. Thanks so much, Carly. CoinShift is a leading treasury management and infrastructure platform for DAOs and crypto businesses that need to manage their treasury operations. Every crypto org needs to manage its treasury, and CoinShift offers a simple, flexible, and efficient multi-chain treasury management platform built on top of the highly secure Gnosis Safe. With CoinShift, your organization can go from primitive, single-chain treasury management to expressive, flexible, and multi-chain treasury features, such as global user management, global contacts, proposal management, and many other features that can be shared across an entire organization, allowing users to save time and reduce operational burdens and gas costs. CoinShift even has data tools like account reporting across the seven chains on which it operates. Used by industry powerhouses such as Uniswap Grants, Balancer, Consensus, and Masari, CoinShift is speeding up the coordination and efficiency of the organizations that use it. You have to keep up with the frontier, and CoinShift makes that easy. So sign up at coinshift.xyz slash bankless. Do you buy NFTs? Do you like playing in the profile picture games or searching for underpriced rares? Or you're part of an NFT community and you want that sweet social experience that your NFT brings you? Of course you want these things. It's why you're listening to this podcast. And it's also why you should check out Sintra. Sintra is the most powerful and friendly all-in-one time saver for NFT investors. A new social fi investment app with real-time sales, floor price tracking, Twitter mentions, and 700,000 wallets, all available to check out. All infused into a social experience to connect you 
you with other like-minded NFT investors. In Sintra, you can do your social media things like post, reply, share, ask questions, react, right next to where you showcase your beloved and cherished NFTs. And you also get a customizable feed of NFT activity, keeping you up to speed with the always changing meta of the NFT world. If you're not using Sintra, you're falling behind. So go to Sintra.com slash bankless and connect your wallet to enter the world of Sintra. Some of the news we didn't get to, Boss Beauties has announced a new chief commercial officer, uh, Yael. Mm, this is a day of hard pronunciations for me. Um, and also, <laughs> I'm looking at the wrong, I'm looking at my wrong screen. Bear with me. Where is my right screen? Bup, 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 bup. We need a way of getting like phonetic pronunciation. Wait, what is it? It's, it was delivered. Yael Afriat. Y-A-E-L is her name. And she is the new chief commercial officer for Boss Beauties. Uh, thoughts, Austin? Maybe I'll start with you. I've got some thoughts, but we'll uh, we'll kick it off with with y'all. Yeah, I, I think it's very much just signaling where they're trying to go. They they even put in a little blurb in the introduction. She has experience at like Mattel with like toys and and games, and it seems to be very much the NFT brand playbook of okay, we've got these assets now. We need to get them into the real world. How are we going to do that? We're going to get them in toys and in people's hands. So yeah, it, it's a good signal in that they're getting someone with experience doing that. They're, they know what they don't know and they're going to bring someone on board. Um, but I still am very much, and this is kind of akin to the Digi Daikaku new, uh, news as well around the Super Bowl ad. I am, I am very cautious with any world building until there is lore or rather I am cautious around consumer products until there's actual lore for people to care about. I think we're skipping yeah. a step. And I understand that these are longer. You need to bring these people on board. You need to, you know, it's a long roadmap to execute getting like plush toys. But and these these characters are they're kind of like they're flat. Like they need they need more world building around them. For people to actually care so that that's the step in like the intermediary step i'd like to see us address as a community i think to that point and and in the spirit of like what does this signal it's striking that her background seems to be in licensing specifically which is what we saw with uh the cool cats hire as well steven tegas not tegas something along those lines though his name is something like that um who cool cats hired as their uh, ceo um and he's he worked at, i think at disney previously more directly in the entertainment industry even than yael's past experience which has been like at dot dash and a company called chief and nothing like kind of directly in entertainment but both having worked on the licensing side so she was the head of licensing for dot dash which is very specific to to your point merchandise um sort of like products or licensing IP as opposed to building core stories of IP. Now she's coming on as the chief commercial officer, right? She's not coming on as like the the lore builder, so that makes sense. But it's um it is interesting to see projects seeming to to kind of be high lately that's what we've been seeing a lot of is is that side of the business. And I don't know if that's because it's been harder to find world builders, if they already have their world builders and those were announcements I missed, if the licensing community executives are, are just more interested in nfts it concerns me a little bit because i feel like there is a misperception especially within hollywood that like that's what this is it's just like another merch line almost and i, and I think it actually is a lot more than that but that's something that that did jump out at me and um uh but you know i think it's great i mean i'd like to see these projects professionalizing also this doesn't it makes it not look like a security right you don't have this going on with stocks you don't have like stocks mm. out there licensing for franchises, right? I mean, you mm. have companies behind them that do that, but when, when the, just with the fact that companies are looking at NFTs as content, media, and licensable properties, to me, that's why, and I'm just obviously linking this back, but that's why, you know, these sorts of moves to me give, bring comfort. Whether this particular, you know, NFT ends up successful, I don't know, but to me, what, what a great sort of example of how this technology can be used to create new content and consumer friendly, you know, digital products. You mentioned Limit Break and Digi Daigaku in there, uh, Austin. That's uh, Gabriel Leiden's company, Limit Break. Uh, Gabe's like a veteran of the of the gaming industry, has now moved into NFTs. Digi Daigaku was their first drop. You shared this with me, Austin. They just announced a Super Bowl commercial. Uh, they, they've 
Limit Break has purchased a super a commercial spot alongside Digi Daigaku for Super Bowl, whatever Super Bowl number we're on. I can't read Roman numerals that fast. <laughs> uh, thoughts on this, Jeremy? I'll share the, the link to this in the in the chat so that you can uh, take a look. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I actually jumped on Ryan Carson's Twitter space this morning. We were talking a bit about it with Mac and had actually someone from the advertising agency who had sold Super Bowl ads on before. So it was really interesting to get her take that you can't really just view this in a vacuum. Like there's going to be an entire advertising campaign that goes on. There will be some like preceding of ads that take place like during the playoff rounds. You have to build a lot around this and there needs to be a call to action, right? I think my immediate gut reaction is is kind of what I brought up before. It's like these people need to have a reason to care. They have to have somewhere to land. And so if the call to action is just for them to look at a bunch of NFTs, I don't think that's going to move the needle. I think you have to build, you have to give them reason to care about these characters. So my hope is between now and February, that's the type of building that's taking place. There's also, and Ryan brought this up, I was kind of hopeful it would be a different project. It would be the first time we were in a Super Bowl. Like, Mm -hmm. yeah, it was cool seeing nouns in the Bud Light ad and like a little tiny board ape, like on one part of an ad for like a split second. But it it's, there's just a lot of unknowns with this project. It makes sense that they can afford it. They raised $200 million. You know, Gabriel seems like a smart guy. Um, so, yeah, we'll see. What's your hesitation? Simply that it's it's sort of newer to the ecosystem, or is there does it go deeper than that? It's new to the ecosystem. I don't know that it's our best foot forward as a community just because I haven't seen enough. I've listened to Gabriel speak a bunch of times. I think he kind of put his foot in his mouth when he was trying to use his platform to talk about free to own. I get where he was coming from. Um, and so I think I just like personally want to see more development mm. of, okay, you've raised all this money. What is that actually going to do for holders and, and what stories are we trying to build? But look, they have a ton of experience. Like he's an OG building like early games on Facebook competing against Zynga. Like this man knows what he's doing. So my hope is that, you know, he's able to use some of that experience, uh, to shine a good light on the space. He does say in this thread uh, where is it? He says the ad itself will be a Web3 experience the world has not seen before. I, I always get a little bit like ah, I seize up a little bit around the Super Bowl commercial thing because it's such a like top signal. Like we saw that in the Web2 era, like Pets.com has their Super Bowl ad or like their Macy's Day Parade float, and, like all those kinds of things, like right before they crash. I think certainly there was a little bit of that happening with the Super Bowl commercials we saw this past time. So it's not that I don't get excited to see it, but I also think Super Bowl commercials have this longstanding history of sort of being vacuous you know what I mean? like they don't really signal that much even though they feel like they signal a lot so if this is actually additive for the industry and that there's something really cool and unique about the ad as he's saying that's that that itself is a web3 experience that could be kind of cool positioning like i, I think that's a win um I, you and i've kind of talked about this because i i haven't listened to, to gabe's more recent interviews i listened to one he gave interesting enough like over a year ago really liked it i think there's been some people who've been maybe rubbed the wrong way it was some of the things he said more recently like now that he's fully in web3 the interview i listened to was like pre him in web3 um so anyway something to keep keep our eyes on jeremy any takes here before i move on to to the next no, next I'm topic. not a football guy. I got no comment here. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. You watch for the commercials. You'll be watching for this. Um, you can jump the, on the Bills bandwagon with Carly and I. Oh, that's anytime. true. That's true. Yeah. It's not awesome a bandwagon. I, my, my, my father's from Buffalo. And so the oh, one time I got hey. into football, the one time I got into football was like 1991. And uh, that was when like Jim Kelly and Thurman Thomas. Yeah, that was game. the golden yeah. era. Yeah, I was really into them. And then and then they burned me over and over by losing Super Bowls. And I'm like, I'm out. I can't do this. Well, so come, the, it's come a back. good time to be a Bills fan. I grew up a Jets fan, and I, the Jets have never felt like this Bills team in my years of watching the Bills feel like they got something special. So we won't bore people with that because that's not why they come to this show, but we are Bills fans. Um, Google will take some cloud payments in crypto. I will tell you, my take on this is a little bit tepid in the sense that this seems to be like a quid pro quo agreement, trying to pull up the article here, where Coinbase is, uh, did I say that? Did I mention that it was with Coinbase specifically? Okay, Google will take some cloud payments in crypto facilitated essentially by Coinbase. And, And part of this is that Coinbase is switching to Google's cloud services 
for, for storing some of whatever, their servers, their data, et cetera. They're moving from Amazon Web Services to Google Cloud. So it does feel like this is just sort of an agreement between the two of them, which, great, it's still a win. It doesn't excite me the way it would if it felt like Google was like, there's such an appetite to pay us in crypto that we've made this business decision to do it. It almost feels like a little bit like a... If they build it, we, if you build it, they will come kind of thing where Coinbase is like, all right, we'll give you our business if you do this. And then maybe there'll be people who want to pay you in crypto. It's cool. I don't think it's world. I had a different take. I think I was okay. like my excitement Bullish. definitely was in within the dock of like, I actually think this is a pretty big deal. Reason being, Google is trying to figure out what their crypto strategy is. I've actually had some conversations with their cloud team and it's very much not like there's a brand problem there, right? Like a lot of what we're trying to build in this space is like anti-corporate, or at least like that's the narrative. And so where do they fit is an interesting problem for them to solve. One area that they have gone full steam ahead on is actually creating the cloud infrastructure for developers, like for people that are trying to build in crypto, they want to be the cloud provider. They want to beat AWS to the punch. So I think this is actually like a very mm. strong signal of intent of, OK, this isn't like the biggest part of our business now, but we're trying to make this an easier on ramp or meeting you where you are. And so it's less about like Coinbase as a partner and much more about the ecosystem of builders that they're trying to support. I do also think that there's something, you know, similar to the, the epic Hadian conversation we were having earlier, where it's like our fastball is not going to be crypto, at least for a long time. So why don't we partner with someone who's been here, who knows how to like custodian crypto assets can actually like give us this can be a strategic partnership where we can yeah. learn a lot more about the space, you know, while still keeping, you know, a, a bit of an arm's distance. So I I was very, very bullish on it. I like that take. I that makes sense that this is sort of a broader play to just entice the crypto ecosystem to do business with with Google's cloud infrastructure. I think I'm maybe a little bit dubious of crypto this is ironic right but like as payment like maybe usdc whatever but like if you're talking about within you know the borders of the united states for example like it's just it's hard for me to see crypto overtaking other just like easier payment mechanisms i think it makes a lot of sense when you're talking about like on a global scale which i'm sure google is i know it says google cloud platform infrastructure will initially accept cryptocurrency payments from a handful of customers in the web3 world who want to pay with cryptocurrency clearly there are people who do want to pay with cryptocurrency broadly speaking though i'm like i you know i'm like always hesitant to give up my my like eth and things like that so i, I think i have doubts around like crypto's big win being in the payment space this um, won't be a quick hit like we would definitely we could definitely dive in deep because i i you know I, I see this from the other side of like i actually think crypto payments are going to by and large be one of if not the primary payment processing over time i don't think we do you think there. it'll do you think it'll be stable coins yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, and I think we're yeah, going to yeah. see a I'm lot more, of central bank stable coins. Certainly. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I agree. Like a like a digital like the what are they called the CBDCs and things. I um, it's so just I'm like actually, I, I don't disagree with that. <laughs> like the the best thing that we have is ACH, and that takes like a day to process your your payments from you know when you your payroll. Like it, there's just there's so much latency in the financial systems that I think crypto eradicates. Yeah, I, I should say I agree with that. I was I spoke with somebody who was dealing with who hopefully I can say this, who was building, you know, sort of this out on the JP Morgan side, like in like institutional payment flows, I think absolutely makes sense. I think I was then talking to somebody who's at Coinbase and who's working on sort of like the consumer peer to peer payment side and feeling like what's going to get me to pay my friend in USDC for dinner over just Venmoing them. I don't know. Like it, it would have, it would take a lot because Venmo is so easy. I do agree that on that institutional scale, when you're talking about internationally. So I, maybe I, I recant my previous statement. We'll, we'll see. We'll see how it plays out. Jeremy, you wanted to say something. Yeah. I, I just, what to me, this, uh, as, as, a, as a lawyer in this space, what this signifies and is, is sort of reflective of is the fact that you have, uh, existing brands and um, and institutions and public companies that are very reticent to hold crypto themselves and to be able to accept crypto as payment and are very skeptical over the whole industry. Now, Google is a tech company, so they're you know a little more tech forward. But what we have to tell clients, they're constantly asking us like, how do we how are we going to do this safely? And we we can't tell them 
just have one of your employees download a MetaMask wallet and that's how you can accept crypto. You need a different solution. You need a much more robust solution. And somebody like a Google needs a really robust, safe, secure solution. And that's gonna be a centralized exchange like a Coinbase. And so to me, in order for this space to grow, you're gonna need those intermediaries, those institutional players that partner up with existing brands and companies that feel safe and that they have, you know, Coinbase has a license through New York and it's regulated. And, and I, I can't imagine the amount of negotiation that took place between Coinbase and Google for Google to get comfortable with Coinbase accepting payments on their behalf. And so to me, that's a real win for the legal teams that finally pushed that through. And it's a real win, even if it's just baby steps. And I think you're both right from what I can hear. Carly, like in the beginning, this is it's baby steps, but it opens a valve, right? It allows them to have this liquidity through crypto, which is really significant and signals comfort from a major company for the industry. Okay, I'm, I'm more excited. I, I, I'm with it. Um, the return of Pixelmon. Pixelmon is back. How, why, for the love of God? I mean, they raised $70 million, so I guess, you know, you've got, you've got options when you have that much money. Um, Liquid X acquired a 60% stake in Pixelmon. Liquid X is a fund uh, founded by Kendrick Wong, who was an early investor, apparently, in Polkadot and BNB chain. Uh, I have to say the Liquid X website copy is syntactically kind of bad. I don't know if they're Asia based and therefore English isn't their first language, but I, I didn't, it's bad. <laughs> There's just some like weird grammatical things happening there with sentences that don't fully make sense. Um, and maybe I'm inclined to just like pick at this fund cause I'm just frustrated that Pixelmon is back, but Pixelmon is back. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah. I, oh gosh. I immediately was like, ah, oh, these guys, I honestly, my gut reaction was I wish they would have bought a hundred percent. Like yeah. I want, I want the holders to have a great outcome here. Like they're ultimately the people that got burned. And so, yeah, if we want projects to come back from the dead, we have to find ways for this transition. So overall, like I hope they release a great game. Like I hope, yeah. I hope it does phenomenal for holders. I'm a little bummed that the uh, founders are going to get to participate in that upside, still holding what seems like 40% or less than that. So yeah, we'll see. Failing up. It's failing up. I mean, yeah, yeah totally we should say up. explicitly, to, you, you were alluding to this, Pixelmon, they're, they're planning to launch the MMORPG, which I guess is what they had always initially promised. They're planning to launch it for NFT holders in Q1 2023, while the game's released to the wilder public whatever the wider public release will be at the end of next year I, I mean yeah i guess so i'm also like that's fast that was a fast that's a fast turnaround honestly for like a really good game to be in the beginning of next year i i guess we'll see um to your point cyber who i guess was the original that's the original guy who was f full of it in a lot of ways um it's still involved it sounds like um which how he isn't getting you know, looked at by the SEC. I mean, he was explicitly saying, you will make money on this. You know, don't do your own research. Like, this is a no-brainer hit. He's young. I talked about him last week. You're right. I can hope for a good, you know, a good outcome for holders. As you can tell by my tone, I'm just, like, disappointed by it. I'm just yeah, like, I mean, there's uh, always... This is the thing, though, like, in, the, in any walk of life, like, there's uniformly not everyone is going to be a good actor that is participating in a project. And so your hope is that like net, the net positive will help the most amount of people. But yeah. yeah, it's incredibly frustrating that the person that stands to benefit the most from this, you know, is, is someone that did, you know, did wrong by his holders. Thousand percent. Yeah. yeah. Uh, all right, let's close with this. You have your Substack, One Big Idea. You recently wrote a, a long explainer piece on Cosmos. Uh, Bankless just did a long episode on Cosmos, so I don't think we dive too deep into Cosmos here. We're already running long as a podcast, but do you want to give us like your biggest takeaway as you dove into the Cosmos ecosystem? And we'll, we'll link to the Substack for folks who want to dig in and learn more. Yeah, well, first, if you're anything like me, Ethereum, Maxi, like you, you've been hearing about Cosmos for a while. You may have known that they were the original proof of stake. They developed it years ago um, and were part of like the early Ethereum building as well. It was just something where I kept seeing so much chatter about this like Cosmos 2.0. There was this big uh, proposal that came out at the end of September with a bunch of core contributors outlining the next stage of the Cosmos hub. The Cosmos Hub is essentially the chain that started the network of blockchains. 
the key thing for people to think of uh, that's different from Ethereum is instead of having like one base protocol, you actually have a network of application-based chains that all talk to one another. And so like if you're running a DEX, if you're running whatever the case may be, they communicate with one another, but they have their own stack so that they can be modular, they can update it to their own needs, but they share security, they share a processing language, um, and they're able to develop in that way. And so this 2.0 basically is elevating the Cosmos hub as like the security layer, the processing layer. Um, it's where like all the development is going to happen. And so it's taking a bit more. Go ahead, Carly. Well, I was going to ask if there's an asterisk there, which is to say there, th this Cosmos 2.0 is, is doing that with the hope that that's what happens. Because it feels like the key difference is that there isn't like a central body of Cosmos the way there is at Ethereum. So we can say yeah. Ethereum is moving to proof of stake and that means the Ethereum Foundation, it means Vitalik. Whereas the 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 devs on the Cosmos side can make changes to Atom, their token, and make changes to to chains on Cosmos. But fundamentally, like, isn't the whole value prop that there's there isn't really that central authority that's saying this or that. And so it's more a matter of like, what are the downstream effects of changes they make to to certain chains? Yeah, the, the, you're absolutely right historically. Like Cosmos is always, the developers of Cosmos have always referred to themselves as an idea rather mm. than like a blockchain <laughs> itself. Okay. Which, God, <laughs> it's like, and, and because Jesus. of that, it, it, yeah, I mean, they've had some massive marketing problems as well. They've, they've admitted that. I think that's why they haven't been in a lot of people's purview, even though they've been building for a long time. Because of that fact, you're right. You've had like a bunch of disparate developing teams with their own prerogative building on these open source protocols effectively. And people can decide whether they use them or not. They can decide whether they use the security or not. It, it has like a, a fairly like makeshift vibe of like DIY to it. The hope is that like they're going to build such strong incentives is again, the hope they're building such strong incentives and using this uniform like Cosmos Hub, the Cosmos SDK and Tendermint that people will gravitate towards it because the they're financially incentivized to do so. So okay. like they want to build Atom as the entire Cosmos ecosystem's reserve currency. What that means is that it'll be used for staking. Um, people will use it for security. They'll actually create um, MEV on chain, like create their own market for maximum extractable value, which is super fascinating. It's it feels like they're that... just turning into Ethereum. Everything I'm hearing you say <laughs> sounds to me like they're taking everything that was distinct about Cosmos and just making it look more like Ethereum. I, I think what they're trying to <laughs> so so basically the, the thesis of it was they were very deliberate, or so they would have you believe in not elevating the Cosmos Hub because they wanted it to be on a level playing field with all the other chains. Because if you're an app developer, you don't want to think like, oh, I'm actually competing with Cosmos here because we have our own chains and they might mm -hmm. drop a DEX and they might do this and they might do that. And it's, it's going to put me at a disadvantage. Now that they've like tested out and built out the thesis of this network of blockchains, it's really about creating a secure, interconnected, like vibrant ecosystem. And in order to do that, they need like a little bit more, for lack of a better word, centralization in their approach of how they're building this out, how they think about bringing more value to holders. And so, yeah, it does have some like Ethereum vibes, vibes. to it. Vibes. If yeah. people are interested in learning more, it's it's tough to, to talk about in a few minutes. Definitely head over to my sub stack. I tried to break link. down like the history of it. <laughs> link. Link <laughs> and, below. Uh, <laughs> link below. And, and yeah, let me know if you have any questions there. I will also caveat disclaimer. I am not a uh, technical person by any means. I also want to give a big shout out to people at uh, BlockWorks Research who helped me a lot and DeFi Llama for, with a bunch of different questions that I had. Um, and yeah, ho hopefully yeah. you can learn something. And I'll say this as a final teaser for folks to maybe go check it out. Because I think the thing that I've always, that, that feels compelling to me about Cosmos from my understanding is like, they do have this app centric approach, which on its surface does make sense to me. Now, it, the devil's in the details, but sort of this idea that the value accrues because of the apps more so than like an underlying protocol. And they've sort of, th their design infrastructure has been on that. Also not technical. That's sort of my understanding. And if that sounds interesting to you, yeah, go check it out. 
Austin, thank you so much. Thanks for joining me. I'm sure we'll have you on again, uh, n- no doubt. And thank you to everybody who's still here an hour and 30 minutes into this podcast. <laughs> this is a long one. I know we got through a lot. So uh, my head's exploding. I'm sure uh, hopefully yours is too, if we've done the job right. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Overpriced JPEGs. If you liked this conversation, if you liked this episode, please go ahead and hit subscribe. It helps me out, it helps the show out, and it means you will get alerts and updates when we post new content. Thanks again.